Hello everyone. This is uh, welcome to this uh, this first session. Geometry processing. I'm Pierre Allier. I will be chairing this session. We have four presentations. The first uh, talk is entitled uh, Combinatorial Construction of Seamless Parameter Domains. The orders are Kiaran Zhu, Shang Jie Chu, Denis, and Mas. Hi everyone, this is Jaren. Today I'm going to give Jaren a talk Zhu. about combinatorial construction of seamless parameter domains. This novel method gives a solution to the problem of constructing seamless parameterizations of closed surfaces. It exactly respects prescribed singularities and supports surfaces of arbitrary topology. So what is this about? When globally parameterizing surfaces, this is not possible without cards or seams. Intuitively, a parameterization is called seamless if across these cards the parametric lines continue smoothly. Concretely speaking, a point P on a card has multiple images in the parametric domain, here Q1 and Q2, on the two sides of the card. In a seamless parameterization, these are related by a transition function. That is a rotation R by an angle that is a multiple of pi over 2, plus some translation. A special case where this translation additionally is integer is closely related to so-called integer grid maps relevant for quadrangulation. Such parameterizations have a variety of use cases in graphics and geometry processing, most prominently perhaps in the context of quad mesh generation, where state-of-the-art techniques rely on seamless parameterizations as illustrated here. Red and blue dots here actually represent the parameterization singularities, which in the induced quad meshes on the right correspond to extraordinary vertices. The problem of computing seamless parameterizations with prescribed singularities has been considered in a long series of works, including the ones listed here. In some applications, singularities are prescribed intentionally by the user. In others, specialized algorithms generate optimized singularity configurations to be respected. Well, these results have enabled the computation and optimization of seamless parameterizations with ever-increasing reliability and robustness. Issues still remain. In particular, the problem of computing a seamless parameterization with prescribed singularities is often formulated as a non-convex problem. The challenges of non-convexity are dealt with, for instance, by simply omitting the non-convex constraints, which can easily lead to invalid results, or by conservative convexification, which excludes some valid solutions, in the worst case leading to an infeasible problem. Other methods reduce the problem to linear programs at the cost, however, of giving up strict adherency to the prescribed singularities. There is one recent method that does strictly respect the prescribed singularities. It employs a novel convex formulation. Still, it requires nonlinear numerical optimization with potential numerical changes in practice. To do away with all this, we approach the problem in a very different way, avoiding all such robustness risks. We observe that in previous methods, the parameter domain, its shape, its boundary, is essentially a byproduct of solving a parameterization optimization problem. We construct such a domain explicitly in the first place, and we do it in a way that, in its core, is purely combinatorial. Therefore, we are not at risk of suffering from numerical issues, from non-convexity, from convergency issues of numerical optimization, and so on. Once we have the domain, defining a map onto it is conceptually easy and can be done using established techniques. Constructing such a domain is quite intricate. Given the discrete setting, 
it、uh, simply is a polygon, of course. However, this polygon has to simultaneously satisfy multiple constraints, because we expect the resulting parameterization to be seamless and to exhibit exactly the prescribed singularities. Angle constraints along the boundary need to ensure that the prescribed singularities are respected. Additional lens capability constraints along the boundary need to ensure seamlessness. And what makes it even harder, such domains typically are and need to be self-overlapping. But only certain types of self-overlap are valid, and warrant that a correct locally injective parameterization onto the domain exists. To the best of our knowledge, there is no known general method to construct polygons that satisfy all that in combination. And this is where our method comes in. Our approach is best understood by considering multiple equivalent interpretations of seamless parameterization and their domains. A seamless parameterization on a surface induces a cone metric. Such a metric is flat everywhere except at cone points, where its curvature is a multiple of pi over two. For each singularity of the seamless parameterization, there is a corresponding cone. For instance, here is a simple general zero surface. With eight prescribed singularities, and a seamless parameterization illustrated by these black iso lines, the induced cone metric defines a cone manifold, which in this particular case we can asymmetrically visualize like this. Though this is rarely possible in general, cutting this manifold to a topological disk along a cut graph here very simple. One can obtain a disk topology cone manifold with boundary. First, cutting this disk cone manifold to the cone here, cut in green, we obtain a domain that is completely flat, because cones now essentially lie on the boundary. This last object is exactly the seamless parameter domain that is commonly considered in previous work. Across the yellow and green cards, this domain satisfies the seamless transition conditions. Notice that in this simple case. Here it happens to not self-overlap. For our work, the viewpoint considering the disk topology cone manifold in the center, however, is a more insightful one. Essentially, for a given surface cut to a disk, we explicitly construct such a disk topology cone manifold, such that first its cone corresponds to the prescribed singularities, and second its boundary matches seamlessly. And third, its boundary is structurally capable with the cut graph of the surface. We incrementally build this cone manifold out of polygons. Let's start with a simple square. It's flat. If we glue four squares together, we get a larger object that still is all flat. But if we glue five squares together, we get an object that is flat within the squares, flat across the edges. But not flat at the central point. There is a cone with curvature minus pi over two. The depiction here is just symbolic, not asymmetric. You have to imagine the five foregrounds here to still be squares. The situation is similar when we are going to glue two, three, or more than five squares together. So now the overall idea is to glue such polygons together to form a larger mesh of polygons. If we then endow each n-gon with such a n-square metric, we have a manifold that is flat everywhere except for one cone in each polygon that is not a foregon. That means by choosing polygon valences, we can control which cones we get. We, however, need to make sure that at each vertex, exactly four polygons meet. Otherwise, additional cones would arise at these vertices. We call polygon meshes that have this valence four property and the additional property that boundary vertices have at most two incident polygons, meta polygons, as depicted here. So the overall strategy is choose polygons that are not foregrounds, such that their list of valences and thereby induced cone curvatures match the prescribed singularity indices, and glue these together. The invariant of this incremental construction is that after each gluing step, the intermediate result always is a meta polygon. The main challenge will be to preserve this invariant, in particular, to glue the polygons such that always four meet at a vertex, and that boundary vertices are all flat or corners. 
Let us emphasize here that our construction is purely combinatorial. We don't assign coordinates or anything to the polygons or their vertices. So let's say how we glue a polygon to a matte polygon while preserving the matte polygon invariant. Glue an icon to a matte polygon, migrate eight concave vertices on the boundary. Then we have to fill up such vertices by foregrounds to keep the output as a matte polygon. Foregrounds are special in the sense that they do not induce additional cones. Hence, we can add arbitrarily many without issues. Depending on the value of i and where the icon is glued, the matte polygon extension has the following situations. When i is larger than 2, if we glue the icon to one side of length 1, no concave vertex will be created. If we glue the icon to one side of length larger than 1, and choose leftmost or rightmost position, one concave vertex is created. We need one grid of foregrounds to fill it up. The other slightly different situation is that we don't choose the leftmost or rightmost position. Then two separate concave vertices have to be filled up by two grids of foregrounds. When we need to glue a two gun, two successive concave vertices will be created. Depending on where the two gun is glued to, one grid of foregrounds or two grids of foregrounds are needed. As an interesting side note, we notice that the number of foregrounds needed for fill up depends on where we actually glue the next icon. Here shows how we count the number of foregrounds under different situations. Let the length of the glued matte polygon side is L. If i is larger than 4, the number of foregrounds is always L minus 1. When we need to glue a 3 gun, let x imply where the icon is glued. Then the number of foregrounds can be computed by such a formulation. When we need to glue a 2 gun, sometimes we also need the length of the sides adjacent to the glue side. Let's say it's L prime. Again, the number of foregrounds can be formulated in this way. By considering this, one can make the choices such that the complexity of final matte polygon is minimized. But whatever choice is made, the algorithm probably yields a valid result. With this operation of matte polygon extension at hand, we can create a matte polygon whose polygon valences correspond exactly to a given sequence of cone curvatures or singularity indices. We just start from the first single polygon and then repeatedly apply this operation. In the end, we get a matte polygon that is a matter 8j minus foregon, where j is the genus of the closed surfaces that these singularities are prescribed on. This is due to the gaussian bonnot theorem relating total curvature to genus. Here is an example result for a genus 3 surface with 24 cones, indicated here by red and blue dots. Notice that we have already equipped each icon with its i squares here, so this is essentially a quad mesh with prescribed irregular vertices. Now remember that this cone manifold conceptually corresponds to the input surface cut open along a cut graph. Hence, the 8 g four sides of this matte polygon or quad mesh are conceptually identified in pairs. This is indicated here by the coloring. Identified sides have the same color. The only problem is pairs of identified sides may have different lengths under the cone metric, that is, a different number of quads. This can be observed here, where we embedded the same mesh into a disk and labeled the sides by their lengths. For instance, the two right sides have lengths 8 and 6, which means they have 8 and 6 quads. This essentially violates the seamlessness condition across the cut. To make this intuitively clear, imagine we would glue the identified size. We would obtain a closed quad mesh of the desired genus and with the desired irregular vertices. However, the quads don't match across the cut. The mesh would be non-conforming there, with T-joints and such. It is unclear how the matte polygon construction could be modified to ensure matching quad numbers. 
Fortunately, in a different work we have recently shown for a continuous setting, how a domain of this kind can be modified to match side lengths. The idea is to add padding to the size, here in green and orange for example, so as to adjust their lengths. We adopt this idea again, however, in a discrete combinatorial manner and pad the metapolygon size by additional layers of quads. A linear system solve tells us how many layers need to be added to each side to achieve an equilibrium state where every pair matches. Depending on genres and the configuration, commonly one more degree of freedom is necessary to make this feasible. We simply allow discrete sliding along a combinatorially strict cut through the metapolygon, here in purple. It follows from a related proof in the previous paper that this is sufficient. For a few very special configurations in the genus 2 case, more than one such cut can be necessary. We refer to the paper for details on that. After that, all pairs of sides have the same length. For instance, here, the two right sides now both have 10 quads. Now we only need to cut from the boundary to the singularities, and we finally have the parameter domain, which by construction is seamless and exhibits exactly the prescribed cones. And that is it, essentially. Of course, that was a relatively simple toy example. Here are some real results. Seamless parameter domains constructed in this way for different singularity configurations are models of varying genres. In the bottom row, you see these domains asymmetrically laid out in the plan. And here's some more. They are not easy to depict it and really understand due to their overlapping nature, but they are all valid by construction. So to finally take a look at the complete process, we are given some input model with prescribed singularities, red and blue here of different indices. Using a cut graph here in yellow, it is cut to disk topology. Using our combinatorial method just described, we construct a suitable seamless parameter domain. And then we bijectively map the cut input surface onto this domain. This can be done using previous methods, such as the one described by Weiber and Zorin in locally injective parameterization with arbitrary fixed boundaries, essentially a generalization of TAT embedding to self-overlapping domains. And here on the right, we see this parameterization realized on the surface by a checkerboard texture. It is seamless, but pretty distorted. But because it is valid, seamless, and free of degeneracy by construction, we can use it as starting point or starting state for map optimization methods. And here you see the results of the uh, optimized map. Notice how domain shape and parametric distortion on the surface change in that process. To summarize, the main contribution of this paper is the robustness combinatorial construction of seamless parameter domains. Then, with a compatible cutting on the input surface, a seamless parameterization over this domain can be established. What we additionally described in the paper is how we can let these two branches of the pipeline communicate it. The lower one that deals with the domain construction and the upper one that prepares the input surface by cutting. In particular, we describe how the geometry of the input model can be taken into account to guide the combinatorial construction. We let it influence the metapolygon construction order and gluing choices, and we let it influence the cutting to the cones to get the final parameter domain. So while all crucial parts of the construction remain combinatorial to ensure reliability, we take geometry into account for soft guidance. This, to some extent, allows us to reduce distortion already of the initial parameterization. Nevertheless, the current strategy leaves room for future improvements. 
a particular valuable and pressing direction for future work turns out to be the investigation of parameterization optimization techniques that are more robust numerically as well as to local minimum than what the state of the art offers. Major advances in these fields in recent years have been on running time improvements, making things faster and faster. But we observe that high distortion initializations, even when they are entirely valid, are often not dealt with well. And this, for the time being, somewhat limits the utility of our method in complicated cases, like the high genus object depicted here, where the initial domain can be really complex. So advantages in this direction really would be of high value for these methods here, as well as certainly beyond for parameterization and map optimization in general. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Jaran. Thank you for an impressive uh, technique. So I'm not collecting the questions. So the first question is, uh, can you elaborate more on how to choose, to choose the size of padding? Sorry, I can't hear you clearly. Can you repeat For it again? Parameterations. First, let's take a look at this. Uh, can you elaborate more on how you choose the size of padding? Uh, how, how I choose the size for padding? Um, all right, so uh, once we have the cut open surfaces, and of course we have the constructed metal polygon, and then we have the same number of corners on the boundary. Then after that, we are trying to measure the distance like choosing different start points on two sides and then measure the total distance, pick the shortest one, then we got the uh, correspondence between the size. Then after that, we have a linear uh, equation system and then we could compute it how many layers for each, uh, like for each pair of the size we need. Then after that, we can um, add the num uh, add the uh, corresponding layers of the quads to each side of the initial metapolygon. We have another question on the chat. Um, can your method also identify whether the input is equipped with the necessary singularities? And what happens, for instance, if I input a sphere without any singularities? Um, so for the improvements, we already did it in our talk paper, and for the details, I refer you to read that talk paper. And for the like the gender zero, uh, uh, so you mean there's no singularities? Then I mean, if there's no singularities, then there's meaningless of our method. So we are trying to handle the cases with singularities. Okay, so um, there is, I have another question, in fact. And what about higher order, uh, higher order, uh, both for the parameterization and for the smoothness across the seams? You know, we start seeing now meshes that have like higher order continuity. Like, do you think your method can be extended to uh, these uh, higher order settings? Mm. Uh, so for this method here, we, um, um, so this is not something we have investigated yet, but our results could serve as the initialize, certainly. Okay, very good. Um, I... I have another question, in fact, uh, about the relocation. So um, can your method be extended uh, to uh, automated relocation of these cone singularities so as to reduce distortion, like continuous relocation, like optimization of the location 
of these cone singularities so as to, let's say, minimize or optimize an objective function? Um, so our master, the goal of our master is try to strictly respect the prescribed prescribed singularities. We didn't do any optimization of the singularities in the process. If this is indeed desired, uh, there are methods that can do this in the subsequent parametrization optimization, like relocating singularities to minimize the distortion. So another question is uh, rela relating to numerical robustness. Like, have you tested your, have you uh, challenged your method on a very, very large number of singularities? And in that case, do you need to, to accommodate this uh, for, for the solver or not? Um, so that is implemented using rotational exact algorithmatic. So the issue is not robustness, but time. And uh, is that answer your question? <laughs> yes, 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 no problem. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, also we, you showed pictures uh, where we see the parametrization that is uh, where you, are, we have, uh, you have overlaps in this parameter domain. Like, have you also uh, explored uh, the possibility to do some sort of packing for uh, mm -hmm. having uh, like a partitioning instead, but with uh, something space efficient in parameter space? Uh, so the uh, parameter domains we constructed, uh, yeah, is weakly overlapping as we mentioned in the talk. So I'm not quite understand what do you say by packing or what do you mean by packing? Uh, packing is when you try to rearrange the, uh, the elements in parameter domain so as to minimize the void and try to be as compact as possible, you see? Um, I think that was not of interest for our use cases, like quad meshing, but for others that might indeed be interesting to explore. Okay, so I now look again at Discord. I don't see additional questions, neither in the YouTube chat. So maybe we have uh, just one more minute for an additional question. If someone wants to step in and ask one last question for Jan. No additional question. Then thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For your introduction. Hello everyone, this is Zhu Tianyu from University of Science and the Technology the next talk of China. Is entitled Grid I am Cut glad to be here. Construction for parametrization. Um, the orders are Tianyan Zhu, Xuanyang Yi, Xuangmin Shai, and Xianman Xianmen Fu. And the presenter is Tianyu Zhu. Let's hold the video. Thanks for your introduction. Hello everyone, this is Zhu Tianyu from University of Science and Technology of China. I am glad to be here to present our work, 
greedy cut construction for permanent rations. First, let's take a look at this problem. Permanentization is a fundamental technique in computer graphics, and is widely used in texture mapping, data storage and precession, surface correspondence, remeasuring, etc. Distortion and cut lengths are two major factors affecting the feasibility and the practicality of permanentations. High distortion means that the corresponding triangle facets will be deformed greatly after a permanentization and the longer cuts will bring more texture, more position. So shortcuts and the low distortion are both required for high quality permanentations. However, solving this problem is very challenging. First, a cut is discreetly represented as mesh edges, which means to select an indefinite number of edges from mesh, and the permutations are difficult to count. Second, Cut construction and permutation generation are coupled. Permutation are usually computed after the cut are determined, and the distortion heavily depend on the cut location. Recently, there are some methods that simultaneously optimize both cuts and the corresponding distortions. AutoCuts treats the mesh as a triangle soup and uses same penalty energy to pull triangles together. Optcast iteratively updates continuous changes in the embedding vertices and the discrete topological changes in the UA mesh. This method can obtain a result with low distortion, but they are often time consuming and the cut length is not short enough. Some methods adopt the point to cut strategy, which contains two steps detect the feature points and then connect these points. This idea comes from a key observation. As long as a cut passes through some spatial points, no matter how these points are connected, the distortion of the final result will be low. Based on this key observation, Gu et al. proposed an alternative algorithm for parameterization and cutting. They parameterize the mesh to plan according to the cut calculated in the previous iteration then finds the vertex with the largest distortion and connects the vertex to the boundary as a new added cut. But this method may be terminated early due to an extreme vertex found on the boundary. Chai et al. uses a hierarchical clustering method from spherical parameterization to locate the feature points. But sometimes the spherical parameterization may fail. In addition, some other methods based on high surface curvature, field, variation, or voting are also used to find a suitable cutting scene. These methods can usually get a result with low distortion, but the cut is often not short enough. We present a novel method to construct shortcuts for permutations with low isometric distortion. The algorithm follows the point-to-cut strategy, where each step is a greedy method. First, we use a greedy filtering process to identify the feature points. Then, a cut is constructed by connecting the feature points and some auxiliary points. Our input is a surface mesh, and our output is a couple of edges to generate a low distortion permutation with as short as possible edges. There are two main steps in our algorithm. Step 1 is to find the feature points. In this step, we first generate a purple cut to find the redundant feature points, then conduct a grading filtering process to eliminate the points that have little impact on the results. In step 2, we aim to find a tree to connect all feature points. Firstly, we greedily find some auxiliary points, then, we connect them with the feature points. Next, let me describe each step in detail. We use a dual cutting strategy to find a purple cut so as to generate a group of redundant feature points. First, we randomly find a cut path by choosing a random vertex as a starting vertex and connecting the farthest vertex to this vertex via shortest path. Then, 
we cut the input mesh along the first cut into a disk topology and compute an as conformal as possible parameterization. We compute the distortion of the parameterization and connect all the local maximizers. Here, the green points in the figure are local maximizers. Next. We define a forbidden region as a union of triangles whose three vertices are all within a specified threshold distance from the local maximizers. Here, the triangles in line in the figure constitutes a forbidden region. Finally, using the same approach as in the first step, we randomly construct the second cut in the largest long forbidden region, then cut and parameterize the mesh as conformal as possible. The corresponding local maximizers, with respect to the isometric distortion, are considered as a set of redundant feature points. If we connect them directly, the parameterization result will have a low distortion, but the cut will be very long. On the contrary, if we delete some useless points, we can get a result with a short cut and a low distortion at the same time. Therefore, we need to filter out some redundant feature points to shorten the cut length while keeping the distortion in a low level. We observe that not all feature points have a significant effect on the distortion. Therefore, we need to determine whether each candidate feature point should be filtered out based on its contribution to the distortion. To mirror the contribution, we define the scope of influence for each candidate as the geodesic distance to the closest vertex with higher distortion. In other words, all vertices within the scope of influence has less distortion than the point. Based on this key observation, we design a greedy algorithm to judge each candidate points one by one. First, we divide all the local maximizers into two initial groups. If a point's scope of influence is larger than a threshold, we put it in the fixed set, otherwise we put it in the candidate set. Then, we connect the points in the fixed set as an initial cut, parameterize the mesh as isometric as possible, and calculate the distortion. Next, we try to add the points in the candidate set into the fixed set one by one. Specifically speaking, we sort the vertices in the candidate set by the scope of influence. In each loop, we connect the first point in the candidate set to the cut and calculate a new distortion. If the distortion decrease is larger than the threshold, we put this first point into the fixed set and update the current distortion. Otherwise, we dump this point. When the loop is done, we get a set of expanded fixed set, as this blue dot showing on the picture. The sketch gives a vivid description of our filtering process. The top and the bottom rows represent the meshes and the corresponding parameterization results. The green dots and the red circles represent the feature points in the fixed set and the candidate set respectively. In each iteration, we first pick up the first point in the candidate set, then connect it to the current cut calculate its corresponding parameterization result, and compute the decrease of distortion. If the decrease is larger than a threshold, the point is accepted as a member of fixed group, and update the parameterization mesh and the distortion. If the decrease is not large enough, the picked points will be dumped, which are marked as courses. After finding the feature points, we need to find a proper path to connect them. We formulate it as a standard tree problem. Given a graph and a set of terminal vertices in graph, the standard tree problem is to find the minimum cost tree connecting all the terminal vertices. Unfortunately, it is an NP hard problem. So, it is hard to compute the exact solution in a reasonable time for a large graph. The method based on minimum spanning tree is a simple but efficient way to find an approximate solution. 
First, all pairs of input terminal points are connected to form a complete graph. Then a minimum spanning tree is treated as the solution. The other common user method is based on shortest path. The tree are constructed starting from a random point and connecting the other points from near to far. We call this method as the shortest path heuristic. These two methods are efficient, but the length of the tree usually far away from the exact solution. So, we propose a greedy connection algorithm to achieve a better approximation standard tree by iteratively selecting some auxiliary points. In each iteration, we use the minimal spanning tree based method to construct a current spanning tree using the feature points and the auxiliary points of the previous iteration. Then, for each vertex of the mesh, we add it to the auxiliary points and recalculate the spanning tree. In this way, we get a set of spanning trees and choose the vertex whose spanning tree is the shortest. We compare this tree with the spanning tree without a new point. If the decrease of the length is larger than a threshold, we add the corresponding vertex into the input set and update the spanning tree. Otherwise, we stop the process. Finally, we find the set of auxiliary points we need and an approximate standard tree as a cut. By the way, we store and reuse the path information of key points in each loop. In addition, the procedure is parallelizable. Therefore, our greedy connection is very fast. We apply our method in various meshes and give some analysis on our algorithm step by step. Our dataset is of about 3,700 models with an average of 13,000 vertices. It contains about two-thirds of CAD models and one-third of organic models. We conduct comparisons with three methods on feature point detection, SIMSA method, geometry image method, and sphere-based method. Here are the results of two examples. We found some feature points are missing for the SIMSA method and the geometry image method, which need to high distortion. As for the sphere-based method, the top row shows that the distortion is lower but there are too many feature points found, so the cut is longer. We analyzed the results on our dataset and plotted the distribution of distortion energy of these four methods. Our method outperforms the other three methods in average, standard deviation, and maximum, which proves our method can find more accurate feature points. To compare the performance on cut construction, we test our greedy algorithm and two heuristic connection methods on around 26,000 test models and draw its cumulative probability distribution. The x-axis in the figure represents the ratio of the approximate method to exact method, and the y-axis represents the cumulative distribution of value of x-axis. Our method outperforms the other three methods in average value. For about 45% of the examples, our results are the same as the exact solution. Here are the comparisons with simultaneous methods. We select the AutoCut method and the OptiCut method as competitors. For AutoCut method, we show the comparisons with the Buddha model and the Tiger model. Our results have much shorter cuts, while the distortions are almost the same. Here are two examples of the comparison between OptiCuts and ours. In the experiment, we first use our algorithm to compute the cut length, time consumption, and the distortion. Then, for fair comparison, the input isometric distortion bound in the OptiCuts method is set as the distortion of our method. In these two cases, our time consumption is much less than OptiCuts, and the cut length is shorter. 
We run optcuts and our method in about 3,000 test models and plot the distributions of the ratio of the distortion energy and the cut lengths in these two charts. The x-axis of the graphs represents the logarithm of the quotient of time consumption and the quotient of length of optcuts to our method, respectively. As shown in the statistics, when producing similar isometric distortion levels, our method is one order of magnitude faster and generates shorter cuts than optcuts method on average. In conclusion, we present a novel method to construct shortcuts for permutations with low isometric distortion. The algorithm contains two steps. Central to each step is a gradient method. After generating a redundant feature point set, a gradient filtering process is performed to identify the feature points. Then, we successively and gradually produce a collection of auxiliary points to shorten the cut length. However, there are also some limitations. Although our method tries to detect necessary feature points in order to reduce isometric distortion, we cannot explicitly bound it. At the same time, for around 20% of the examples, our method generates longer cuts than the optcut method. This indicates that our output leaves room for improvement in reducing cut lengths. Therefore, efficiently and effectively reducing cut lengths while bounding isometric distortion is an interesting direction for future while research. Bounding isometric distortion Thanks for your is listening. An interesting direction for future while bounding research. Iso Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'm currently reading the chat and Discord. I see no questions yet, but uh, for the audience, feel free to ask any question you may have. In the meantime, I will ask you a first question. Um, so you have this greedy, greedy selection of uh, these uh, singularities, but what about trying to solve a trade-off, something like complexity and distortion trade-off, something that balances between the number of singularities and the distortion. How have you thought of solving that that would be more like either a trade-off or perhaps also a multi-objective uh, function? Mm, thanks, for your, thanks for your problem. Uh, in the in the algorithm, we select two, two threshold. The first threshold is mainly used to, um, to, to filter in the, the landmarks. And if, if the threshold is very, very small, uh, and uh, more landmarks will be, uh, it was, uh, more, nan more landmarks will be filtered out. And uh, the final uh, distortion uh, is usually will be small, and uh, it will uh, on, on the, the the second uh, the second threshold is used to uh, get a trade off between the uh, the runtime and the final result of the cut uh, of the tree length, and uh, in uh, if the threshold is very small. Uh, the tree length is usually to be sh uh, a small, a slightly shorter, a slightly shorter. Uh, in the in the experiment, all the models, the the thread of all models uh, are, the, are the same, and uh, the value we use and uh, the value we use is uh, is used, and we also test uh, different uh, different. Uh, uh, Different uh, values, and we use uh, the 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 threshold that uh, performs best. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I see no other questions so on the chat, but I will ask for another one. Um, what about so here the. Uh, the selection of the singularities, they coincide with vertices, but assuming you want to further reduce the distortion and so on, 
can you imagine extending your method such that you would select a location, singularity location, like in the middle of a phase, after, of, of course, performing uh, mesh refinement, mesh division? Is it something you can imagine in even higher order settings, for instance? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what about uh, your your program. Uh, can you say it again? I'm sorry. So um, right now you are working in a full fully discrete setting, right? Or you are working on a mesh. But oh, yeah. suppose that um, suppose that you are conceptually you 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 think of this mesh only as an approximation of something higher order with a higher order smoothness, okay? And uh, in that case, you understand that perhaps the optimal location for your uh, singularities uh, could not coincide with the vertices of your input mesh, right? Let's say even in a higher order setting and so on. So it's why I'm just asking whether you can imagine extending your method to select locations of singularities elsewhere. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we uh, optical method is is uh, are used as uh, our one of our competitors of our method. But in fact, uh, in you uh, the optical method uh, are also need to cut the uh, general zero mesh first. You uh, we have tested that you will you will use our result as the first cut of the optical method and uh, the running result the, of the optical method is it will be uh, faster and better uh, so i think uh, this uh, the landmark we found uh, when the landmark we found uh, is best uh, is based on its uh, distortion of the our first cut and second uh, is based on the distortion of our second cut and uh, it is uh, sometimes or usually related with the uh, uh, singularities, but uh, it is not uh, exact exactly the singularities. I, I, uh, I think uh, our result can be used as a uh, uh, initial uh, used as a first step of the uh, other method yes thank you very much okay i see no more questions neither in discord nor in the chat so let's thank the speaker one more time thank you can you thank you very much So the next talk is entitled Locally Supported Tangential Vector, N Vector, and Tensor Field. The authors are uh, Nazikun Aman, Christopher Brandt, and Klaus Hildebrandt. And the presenter will be Nazikun. Hi, everyone. I am Nazikun. And today I'm excited to share our recent project on locally supported tangential vector and vector and tensor field at this online Eurographics 2020. The idea of using some notion of tangential fields to encode directional information on the geometry is prominent in computer graphics. Some examples are tangential fields are used for BRDF editing. Rotationally symmetric fields guide the synthesis of artistic line drawings. Texture and stripes pattern on the surface align to the tangential fields on surfaces. The problem that we are addressing is that, at the one hand, editing tools require interactive responses. On the other hand, many triangles are needed to accurately represent complex geometry. Therefore, for vector field editing, we need to solve large-scale optimization problems. 
our observation is that we need many triangles to be able to accurately represent a shape. And now, since the vectors are associated to the triangles, edges, or vertices of the mesh, the degrees of freedom that we have for tangential field map processing depends on the number of triangles of the mesh. So it can be a million of degrees of freedom. And the question is, do we need all of them? In many modeling scenarios, for example in this case the fur design, we only specify some small number of constraints. And we want to create smooth fields satisfying those constraints. This means that there is no need for a million degrees of freedom for the modeling. In this work, we introduce a construction of space of tangential field on complex meshes that one can use to construct subspaces that are appropriate to the task at hand and independent of the mesh resolutions. For tasks like shape modeling or simulations, similar approaches are also used. In this example, uh, we see a complex meshes that is deformed by a few handles only. And in fact, it is only 40 dimensional subspace, while the mesh has several thousands of triangles. In, in deformations, the difference between one configuration to another is governed by deformation fields. And one might think that we can just simply use the same technique for tangential vector field. But the problem is, deformation fields are not tangential. So new constructions of spaces for tangential fields are needed. Therefore, we propose novel constructions of tangential fields that can be used to construct lower dimensional spaces of tangential fields on highly resolved meshes. And this can be used to create appropriate spaces for tangential field design and processing tasks. Now, let us give a review of our approach. Our approach consists of three simple steps. First, we do sampling. Uh, we throw samples on the surface, and the number of samples corresponds to the desired degree of freedom that one wants to work with. In our constructions, we are using the farthest point sampling for equidistance distribution of samples. The second step is to create region. On every sample, we grow a geodesic disk of a predefined radius centered at the sample. And the radius is chosen so that the disk overlaps with the neighboring disks. The last step is to compute the smoothest fields on each region. Sampling, create region, and creating the local fields. So, how to construct the smooth field in the region? Let us first look at the constructions of an individual field on the surface. So once we have the region, we want this field to be localized and smooth. So we specify region of support for the vector field, and we want to construct the smoothest field that finishes outside of the region. And by the, by the smoothest field, we mean the field that has the least Dirichlet energy. How to get that? For each edge of the mesh, the energy sums the squared length of the difference of the two vectors on the, on the triangles adjacent to the edge. And to measure the difference, one vector needs to be parallelly transported to the other triangle. And to construct a field in the region, we compute a minimizer of the Dirichlet energy of all fields that finish outside of the region and have unit L to norm. And this yield 
to an icon of failure problems involving the Laplace operator. And one thing that we need to note here is that the icon of failure problem is only defined on the region. And the region is small and we don't really need to, we don't need to solve in the whole surface. And the minimizer of this problem is not unique, but the lowest icon space is two dimensional. The two icon fields differ by 90 degree rotations of each vector on each tangent plane. And that's it. That's already our algorithm. So we first we sample then we create a region and we compute the smoothest field in the region. And that seemingly straightforward approach turns out to have remarkable properties. First, the approach is general, meaning it's applicable to all range of tangential fields and discretizations. Only a Laplacian needs to be available. In the paper, we demonstrate three different fields, the vector field, and Rossi field, and tensor fields. And the second property of the approach is the scalability. We can build large subspaces of thousands of dimensions on highly resolved masses with millions of triangles. And here is one example of spaces of different dimensions ranging from 500 to 2000 to, to 20,000 constructed on the same mesh and we can see on the right that the storage required to represent basis remains constant and the reason is that if we increase the dimensions of the space we need more sample points then as we have more sample points we can we can decrease the size of the disks and because the number of triangles contained in the disk corresponds to the non-zero entries in the basis, we can keep the same non-zero entries for various subspecies by changing the radius of the disk. Also, the computation time needed to solve the to compute the basis remains similar because if although more eigenvalue problems need to be solved for uh, large number of subspaces, but each of the icon failure problem is smaller in the size compared to the others. And the third property is smoothness. By constructions, the resulting fields of the approach are smooth, measured by the judicial energy corresponds to Laplace operator used. Fourth, we observe that the subspace provides very good approximations of the smooth fields. In this example, we see a blue reference field and red fields that are the projections of the reference field to the subspace. And we can clearly see that they match very well. And the relative approximations error is only 2%. The fifth property is adaptivity. It is very simple to make this method adaptive. What we need to do is to change the metric that we use for sampling and region growing. So suppose that we are interested in designing tangential fields at the face of the model. So we can adjust the metric to get more degree of freedoms on the region simply by scaling up the distance matrix at the area of interest. And by doing so, instead of this uniform sampling, we will get more degrees of freedom in the desired area. And as a result, we could improve the accuracy of tangential field design significantly. And from this image, from these two images, we can observe that the approximated green fields constructed from adaptive sampling align nicely with the reference blue fields. While on the other hand, the red fields that are generated from uniform samplings 
performs not as good as the adaptive sampling. And we now highlight some cool applications that thanks to the proper scheme can run at interactive rate even for large mesh models. So, uh, so let us mention that in our setting, we consider an optimization problem with quadratic objectives that often arise in the tangential field design and processing. And the main goal of the subspace constructions is to enable subspace methods for tangential field design and processing. And what we mean by that is, loosely speaking, is to transform an n by n problem to a d by d problem. Right? In which n is associated to the mesh resolutions, or it could be the number of triangles or the number of vertices, depending on the discretization. Well, d is the dimensionality of the subspace. D is chosen to be much smaller compared to N. And by doing so, we can then transform the, the problems into a much lower dimensionality that we can solve independent of the mesh resolutions also much more efficiently. Alright, so the first application that we want to highlight is the vector field design. And one typical goal of vector field design is to compute a tangential field that are on the one hand smooth and on the other hand line with input data provided by the user, for example in terms of the strokes. And we implemented a vector field manipulation tool for first design that we can use to speed up the design process. Uh, if we compare to the reference space, it takes around 50 seconds to solve one user constraint. In contrast, our method allows us to solve it in less than 50 milliseconds. That's two order of magnitude faster. Another application that we consider is for Enfield design. The Enfield design can be used to control the stroke directions of synthesized line art drawing. The fields are first aligned to the maximum principal curvature directions of the surface, and then the user can use interpolation constraints to modify the two fields. And the third application that we want to mention is the tensor field smoothing. We implemented a tensor field smoothing tool that minimizes a weighted sum of functions that penalize the deviation from the approximated input field on the left and, a harmo and, and harmonic and biharmonic energies for tensor fields as a regularizer to the smoothness. And since the computations in the subspace is very fast, then we can adjust the weight of those two terms interactively to obtain the desired outcome. And you are welcome to read our paper for more applications. And to justify our constructions, we compare our approach to other possible constructions and also to existing techniques. First, let us compare two alternatives of possible constructions. And instead of taking two smallest icon fields, that what we do here, constrained to the local regions, there are also some other possible choices for local field spaces. The first one is by getting the smoothest field as a result of minimizing the biharmonic energy on the region. So, what we mean by that, uh, we specify a boundary conditions on the regions, shown as the yellow area here, and we add a hard constraints of a vector with a magnitude of 1 at the center of the disk, which is displayed by the red row in this image. And the minimizer of the biharmonic energy that satisfies 
both constraints are used as the basis field. And another possible scheme to create the basis is by creating radial basis functions. And then computing the gradient and co gradient of the radial basis functions as the basis field. The third option is to compute the smoothest global eigenfields of the model. And then we scale the magnitude by the radial basis functions on each of the sample's faces. And we use the result as the basis for our locally supported fields. One other possible choice of basis is to take not only two but more eigenfields per selected region. So instead of two, we could take three, six, or even ten. But and now let's see why why our construction is better. So we compare the performance of the alternatives constructions in approximating the eigenvalues of Laplace operator of the corresponding fields. And with the orange straight line here represent the reference eigenvalues. And ours is the dash green lines. It is clearly feasible that our constructions outperforms the other alternatives by large margin. And now we compare our constructions to the existing approach. So one other possible subspace constructions that can approximate the reference field then that, that can approximate the reference fields very well is the icon basis. So what they do what they basically do is they solve a general eigenvalue problem of Laplace operator on the whole surface. Right? And once they solve it they use the icon vectors as the basis for tangential field design and processing. And despite being powerful in approximating the smooth fields, they require to compute and to store dense icon vectors of large models. And this limits the applications of the icon basis. And in, in contrast, our method is sparse by constructions. And let's see some statistics here. For the same storage budget, we could have much more degrees of freedom compared to the icon basis and it yields to significantly better approximations and when we want to target same accuracy our scheme allows for much less storage compared to the icon basis and looking forward there's still a lot that we can do with tangential fields In this work we limit our focus to optimization problems with quadratic objectives. And for more general problems, additional techniques are needed to be developed that allows us to approximate the objective and its gradients at a cost that does not depend on the measure solutions. And the, sub the subset approximations can approximate the low and mid frequency very well, but the high frequency are not captured. Another potential is to construct a multi-level solver for tangential fields problems. Our approach can also be extended to include sophisticated boundary conditions for eigenvalue problems that we use for field constructions. So in conclusions, we introduce a construction of subspaces of tangential vector and vector and tensor fields that are scalable, general, adaptive, and can approximate the smooth fields very well. We evaluate and show that these properties indeed hold and we also discuss applications that we can build on top of the approach. We also demonstrate that the construction outperforms the alternatives constructions. And with that, we conclude our talk and we thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Nazikun. Thank you. Um, I did not see any question in the uh, Discord or in the chat. So Hello, I'll ask everyone. just for a quick question. 
Um, what about a fully progressive approach that could be interruptible? Suppose a method where you can um, really uh, interrupt it and yet guarantee that you get always the best accuracy or trade time for accuracy optimally. So if I if I understand that qu that question correctly, so we mean that we can we can adjust the the location of the sample point such so that it meets the requirements of the accuracy. Is that what you mean? Uh, I would say more like a method that uh, which would be in addition to be adaptive, localized, uh, would be fully progressive, where you could even refine the accuracy across time. And, okay. Something like yeah. that. Okay, I see, I see. So uh, I would say that this approach could be like extended as a multi solver approach, in which like the, the, the result of, of this approach would be in the courses level, and we can build a grid in which we can define the solution such so that we meet the accuracy that we really want. And I would say that that is very possible for that. Thank you very much. Um, I do not see any questions, so I propose uh, to thank the speaker one more time. Thank you, Nazikun. And the last talk of this session is entitled Efficient Homology Preserving Simplification of High Dimensional Simplicial Shapes. The others are Ricardo Filegara, Federico Juricic, Leila De Floriani and Uderico Fugacci. And the presenters are Federico Loricic and also Ricardo Filagara. Let's roll the video. This is Federico Juricic, and this is our work on efficient homology preserving simplification of simplicial complexes. This work is made in collaboration with Ricardo Filagara, Leila De Floriani, and Uderico Fugacci. So I said homology preserving. But let me introduce what homology is, first of all. Um, now, to keep this like intuitive and simple, let's look in particular what homology is in the different dimension. When we talk about zero homology, we are intuitively just counting the number of components um, forming the shape. When we're talking about one homology, we're actually counting the number of holes that we can find in the same shape. And when we're counting the number of two homology, we are identifying the number of voids in the shape itself. So this idea generalizing in higher dimension. Um, but let's look at a couple of examples in uh, 3D. So if we consider the mesh data set here, we have the zero homology, which is one because it's composed by only one object. Um, we have the one homology is one because we have only one cycle formed by the hand, the thumb, and the index. And we have two homology zero because the bottom of the hand is open. So there is no cavity that is completely enclosed. Um, in a different example, the fertility statue, we have still the zero homology, which is one. Um, we have the one homology, with, which is m way more complicated this time because we have multiple cycles. And we have the two homology, which is one because this time, uh, there is a cavity, the inside of a mesh, which is completely enclosed by the mesh surface. Our goal is that of uh, simplifying a mesh by preserving its homology. So we want the original shape and the simplified shape to have exactly the same homology. Um, at the same time, we want to be able to do this in any dimension. Let me introduce a couple of definitions useful for our work. So we call K simplex the convex cell form by K plus one vertices. So this is a general name for entities like vertices, edges, triangles, and tetrahedra. Uh, then, like given two simplices, we say that one is the face of the other if uh, the smaller one is a subset of the bigger one. Vice versa, we'll call the bigger one a coface of sigma. Uh, so, for example, if we consider a triangle, a vertex V is a face of the triangle T, and vice versa, the triangle T is a co-face of the vertex V. So, if we take a collection of simplices, they form a simplicial complex. If the face of all of these simplices are also in the simplicial complex, and if the intersection of any two simplices is either a empty set or a face of both. Two relationships are very important in our case. So one is the star of a simplex. 
which is in general is just the collection of cofaces of the simplex itself. So, so for example, for the vertex here, the star of the vertex V is formed by the ring of triangles and edges incident in such vertex. Similarly, this can be done for the edge as well. The second relation which is crucial is the link of a simplex. This is formed by the set of simplices which, is, which are on the boundary of the star of the simplex itself. So let's look at the vertex here. Consider the star of the vertex that we have talked about just a second ago. And now consider all the simplices that are on the boundary of some of the simplices in the star but that are not incident in Fu. If we do that, we will obtain this one ring formed by vertices and edges in the neighborhood of uh, the vertex V. And same idea can be applied to the edge E. So if we take the star of E, we take all the simplices on the boundary, we will have like edges and vertices, but only two of them are not incident into the edge E. And in this example, these are the two vertices in green. So what are the two components of a homology preserving simplification? On one side we have a simplification and in our work we consider an operator like the edge contraction to perform such simplification. Now to provide an intuitive description of the edge contraction we can always implement this by considering an edge that we want to contract and so we pick randomly one of the two vertices on such edge and we remove that vertex. And then after that we remove all the simplices that are in the star of the edge that we have selected and we redirect the simplices with, that were on the star of the first vertex that we remove into the second vertex. If we do that we obtain an edge contraction. The second part is the homology preserving part. So we want to apply edge contraction, but we want this contraction to be homology preserving. And to do that, an operator has been introduced by Day et al. in 1999, but basically works uh, based on the link of the simplices involved in the edge contraction. In particular, we have to consider the link of the first vertex involved and the link of the second vertex involved. We have to compute these two links and intersect them. If their intersection is contained, in the link of the edge, then the uh, operation is homology preserving. So, for example, in the image on the left, we can see an homology preserving operation because the link of the two vertices, depicted in blue and in red, if we intersect them, we obtain two vertices, V3 and V4. Now, incidentally, these two vertices are also belonging to the link of the edge. And so, for that reason, that edge contraction there is homology preserving. In the example on the right, instead, the vertex V4 is still containing the intersection of V1 and V2, but that is no longer containing the link of edge. And so in that case, the um, edge contraction there is not homology preserving. So what is the problem? The problem is that when we are working in higher dimension, the number of simplices there grows exponentially. And so computing the link of vertices and edges becomes extremely computationally intensive. Um, two existing solutions have been proposed uh, to solve this problem. One is the weak link condition, uh, which basically tries to compute the link condition working on vertices, then edges, then triangles, and so on. So just on one level um, of simplices. And another possible solution is that of using the skeleton blocker, which is a data structure that has been developed specifically for um, the purpose of performing homology preserving simplification. We will get back to these two approaches in the experimental section. So what is our approach then? Our idea comes from the fact that top simplices, which are by the way, the, those simplices have only one co-face. So for example, in a triangle mesh, um, triangles are the top simplices. These simplices are not affected by the dimension of the complex. And so if we can restrict our computation and our algorithms to work only with top simplices, we can achieve efficiency. So our proposed approach combines a data structure that efficiently encode uh, simplicial complexes by means of the top simplices and two new definition of edge contraction and link condition based on the top simplices. So the first ingredient of our solution is the Stellar Tree, a special topological data structure introduced by Feligar et al. in 2017. The idea of this data structure is that to decompose a simplicial complex in subset. 
Um, so if we start from a simple shell complex, we can take its vertices and subdivide them based on a spatial subdivision, for example. And we can do the same with the top simplices of the complex by associating each simplex to all the subset that contains its vertices. Now, what is the benefit of doing that? The benefit comes at computational time. So if we have a global data structure, every time that we want to compute something on that, we will generally start by extracting some topological relationship and then we will run the algorithm that we want. Uh, and, and all of this will be performed at a global level. While with the Stellar Tree, we can work block by block. So we can focus our attention on each subset um, of the uh, simplicial complex and just work locally there. So extracting and deleting information every time that we have done with a specific block. The benefit of doing that is of course that the memory consumption is lower since we don't have to extract the information for the entire simplicial complex. The second component of our solution is a top-based definition for an edge contraction. Now here the steps are pretty much the same as for a normal edge contraction. Every time that we want to contract an edge, we still remove a vertex V i, and we still remove all the top simplices that are in the star of V1 by redirecting them into the star of the second vertex V2. However, there is one additional thing we have to pay attention to, which is the introduction of new top simplices. For example, here, in these two figures, by performing that edge contraction, we are creating a new top simplex, gamma 2, uh, coming from the contraction of the top sim simplex sigma 2. Uh, now, all the details, of course, are provided into the, uh, our paper, but the idea is just that. So, like, we can obtain a top base edge contraction by performing a normal edge contraction and just paying attention to the introduction of new top simplices. The last ingredient of our solution is the top baseline condition, which is defined as follows. Uh, now, even if the formula can be a little bit confusing, computing it is very simple. We just have to take the two vertices uh, involved in the edge contraction and we extract these two set of simplices, the top simplices that are incident into each edge. So these are lighted in red for the uh, red vertex V1 and in blue for the vertex V2. Once we have all these simplices, we compute pairs of them and we intersect them. So for example, we take the top simple sigma 3 and sigma 5 and we intersect them, thus finding uh, an intersection vertex V3. Now we have proved that if there is a top simplex in the star of the edge, which also contain uh, this vertex V3, then the uh, edge contraction can be uh, preserving homology. So the link condition is satisfied. So, for example, in this case, since we have um, a top simple sigma 4, uh, which intersected with sigma 2, create V4, and since we have this uh, vertex V4, which is not contained in any top simplex uh, incident in the edge that is going to be contracted, then we can conclude that the edge contraction is not homology preserving, so the link condition is not satisfied. We have proved that the link condition is equivalent to the top base link condition. Of course, the advantage is that we can implement this by working only on the top simplices. Now that we have introduced all the ingredients of our proposed solution, we can look at the actual results. Uh, we took the, uh, our approach and the approach based on the weak link condition, and we have implemented both by using the stellar tree st data structure. And on the top of that, we compare also against the stellar skeleton blocker, which is um, provided by the GUDI library. Um, we have compared all these three methods by using lower dimensional meshes, so six triangle meshes and two tetragonal meshes, and also by using 15 higher dimensional simplicial complexes. Before looking at the actual results, let me briefly introduce how the skeleton blocker is defined. The skeleton blocker uses a dual approach with respect to storing the top simplices of a simplicial complex. The blockers of a simplicial complex are defined as missing simplices. Um, let me explain this with an example. Like if you look at the simplicial complex here, we have, for example, the triangle FCD, which has all its faces, edges, and vertices inside the simplicial complex, but the triangle itself is missing. So that is the example of a blocker. In this example, we have only two blockers here the triangle FCD and 
DCD. Um, so the skeleton block here encodes the blockers, the vertices, and the edges of a simplicial complex. The reason why blockers are important for a molecule preserving uh, edge contraction is that the presence of a blocker around an edge that is going to be contracted uh, basically prevents the uh, contraction. So if we have a blocker there, we cannot perform the edge contraction unless we want to kill some homology class. Say that we can move to our comparison. We started working with triangle meshes and tetrahedral meshes, and our objective here is just that of applying as much simplification we can with the three approaches, comparing their performances. And we encountered the first problem um, of using the skeleton blocker in that case. If we want to load a pre-computed mesh on a skeleton blocker, the memory consumption is going to be huge. That is because a lot of memory is required to identify the blockers within this mesh. Uh, so in this case, for example, we can see that for the Lucy dataset, which is composed by 14 million vertices, we have to uh, use up to almost 6 gigabytes of RAM just to load the mesh even before like uh, performing any simplification. While with the Stellar approach, we can use just a fraction of it and be extremely more compact. Regarding time performances, we found out that our approach is the best one. Uh, so when working on with triangle meshes, um, we are five to nine times faster than the skeleton blocker, while, while on tetrahedral meshes, we are at, at least 35 times faster than the skeleton blocker. Uh, now in this free graph, we are showing in particular the time spent for uh, performing the edge contraction and the time spent for performing the, for checking the link condition. So we may notice that the skeleton blocker is extremely efficient at verifying the link condition, but is very slow in performing the edge contraction. In our case, it, the dual is true. So the link condition takes more time than performing the actual edge contraction. We can also notice that in this case, top link condition and weak link condition are comparable in terms of performances, but we will see in a second that when we move to higher dimension, the difference will become huge. Now, before uh, moving to higher dimension simplicial complexes, we need to clarify how we compute them. Since we have just seen that the skeleton blocker is not performing well if we pre-compute uh, a complex or general complex and we input that inside the data structure. So for this reason we move uh, to Gatorys series complexes, which are a specific type of complexes computed as follows. We start by a point cloud and we define a distance function as well as a value for this function. Uh, and we connect all points that are closer than this defined value. So after we have done that, we obtain basically a graph, we can compute the clicks of this graph, and then we obtain the Vietoris Reeves complex. Now the reason why this complex is uh, perfect for the skeleton blocker is because it presents no blocker, and so its computation and its encoding inside the skeleton blocker is uh, incredibly efficient. We created 15 complexes in total, um, with very diverse characteristics. Some of them are in dimension 7 all the way up to dimension 68, and some of them are composed by 1,000 vertices all the way up to 14 million. Um, so the first issue that we encounter here is that with so many simplices arising, the weak link conditions start uh, not performing well. So in practice, it goes out of memory with most of the data, and it's capable of running only with six of them. Uh, the skeleton blocker performs much better and is capable of running correctly with 14 of these data sets. In our case, we have no issue and our approach is able to terminate with all the complexes considered. Now, since providing a complete overview of all these data sets is very complicated in just a couple of slides, and of course you will find all the results in the paper, I want to show you just a couple of examples uh, which express a core take-home lesson. The first data set that I want to show you is the claim dataset, which is a 61-dimensional simplicial complex. And we can notice that in this case, we don't have a lot of vertices here. So there are not a lot of edge contraction that we can perform. And indeed, in this case, the, our approach and the skeleton blocker performs pretty similarly, roughly like close to two minutes to uh, fully simplify the dataset. And we can notice that the trade-off that we've seen before appears again. The, our approach is very efficient in computing the edge contraction, but is pretty slow in performing the link condition. On the other way around, 
The skeleton blocker is very efficient with the link condition part and uh, pretty slow with the edge contraction. Of course, when we start using a data set that has way more vertices, the problem um, increase even more for the skeleton blocker. So in this case, for example, where we have 40 million vertices and we are still in higher dimension, we get that our approach is much, much faster for the fact that we are efficient in performing the edge contraction. And so since there are more edge contraction to be uh, performed, we can win in that comparison. To conclude, uh, we have defined a new efficient method for simplifying simplicial complexes in arbitrary dimensions. We have proved that our approach is at least one order of magnitude faster when simplifying triangle or tetrahedral meshes, while specifically in high dimensional simplicial complexes, uh, we have obtained that our approach beats the uh, approach based on the weak link condition that is not able to really scale on higher dimensional complexes and it's comparable to the skeleton blocker when working on simplicial complexes of small sites and becomes more efficient than it when scaling on uh, bigger simplicial complexes. Regarding the future work, we would like to define a refinement operator dual of the simplification operator that we have been introducing in this work so that combining the refinement operator and the top-based edge contraction, we will be able to define a multi-resolution model that at this time will allow a user to fully investigate a higher dimensional simplicial complex is still preserving its homology. With this, I'm going to conclude. Thank you so much for your attention. Hello. Thank you very much, Federico and Ricardo also. We have two presenters with us in the room. So are there questions? Uh, I don't see uh, some questions uh, yet. Uh, ah, yes, we have the questions. So uh, the first question is, um, if I understood correctly, your method does not require a previous knowledge of the homology of the considered simplicial complex, so is it possible to use it to compute such homology with reasonable computational cost? And more in general, which are the main applications? That's the first question. Yeah, like the um, the first is true. Like since we don't have to compute the homology at first, like we can simply like take an object, simplify it as much as we can, and then compute the homology at the end. So like supposedly, since we will have way fewer simplices there we should be faster in doing that. Uh, even though, like, to be honest, we, we didn't try it uh, ourselves. We just kept track on the total number of simplices. Um, in, terms, in terms of application, the idea, um, we didn't consider one application specifically. And that was because like certain application would be very good for uh, the approach that we were using in like, the, in, like extracting one specific uh, simplicial complex and doing that would have forced us to encounter problem with the skeleton blocker, but kind of forced us to necessarily compute uh, VRE series complexes. Um, in general, we see like this type of complexes to become important when we are analyzing higher dimensional um, uh, point clouds. So when we have a data set that is either a point cloud or a network, and this data set is um, well, not necessarily the data itself in higher dimension, but the complex that we want to construct to infer topology needs to be in higher dimension because it cannot just model something that lives in a 2D or three-dimensional space. Uh, then is where the problems begin. And, and, and so like we, we are definitely looking into all those applications where a topology needs to be inferred. So we are talking really about like and like analysis of RNA or like analysis of social network where we are provided an input network with nodes and arcs and we want to, for example, model clicks there. There is probably no way or like the amount of information that we can get from just computing edges, triangles or tetra either is limited. And so we definitely want to uh, not limit the dimension of the simplicial complex. Um, so yeah, that, that was like the kind of possible application we were looking at. Thank you. Another question is uh, which criterion uh, is used to choose the edge to be contracted? Right. Um, so in this case, 
I think we were not applying any criterion at all because we wanted to, so we were basically uh, just like taking any order on the edges and simplifying that because we didn't want to slow down, we didn't want to confuse the performances of, for example, organizing a priority queue for, for putting like all the edges in a list and improving them. And we wanted to test like how much time was required by performing the edge contraction and testing the link condition. And also we needed to enforce that this queue was gonna be the same for both the other structure where we comparing them. So we kind of like take off all the, um, um, the idea of computing a matrix, quadrix, silency, whatever, like we took that off. We just like selected an order, any order of edges, and we just like enforced the same order for both data structure when we compare them. But of course, like the, the order in there, um, we can use any order. Like it's just an additional step in the preparation of the queue. And actually the reason why we didn't select a specific order, it's also like um, um, the reason why some of the meshes that you see there, like the 3D meshes are not um, super clean, like are not optimal, even when we are simplifying that, they look pretty ugly. And that is because the, we are not really following any geometrical error, error when we are simplifying those. Thank you. Another question is, uh, does the method work on non-manifold domains? If yes, how do you compute the case boundary to test the link conditions? Oh yeah, yeah. like the, the simplicial complex is, is not required to be manifold at, at all. Um, so let me think about like the, um, what is the possible difficulty there? Because I don't see the challenge of extracting that. So like maybe I should say that in our case, like in, in the stellar decomposition, decomposition, the boundary of any simplex is represented by its vertices. So in that sense, like when you have, when you have a, a simplex and you want to extract the K boundary of that, you just take like a subset of its vertices. And that is the uh, face, that is how the face is represented. So maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but like, yeah, I don't see like a particular challenge in doing that. The very last question, uh, beside, the, uh, beside the skeleton blocker, how this approach compares with a naive implementation uh, in which you verify the link condition for all the sub-dimensional simplices? Um, yeah, that's right. Like we are definitely reporting more uh, a result on that on the paper that is like I, I guess like they're referring to the weak link condition so like the idea where we are not verifying the entire link condition extracting all the faces and all the simplices in the link at once but we work dimension for dimension and and they're like that is basically the starting point of our work so like we starting from there we started implementing that approach and if we find out that as soon as we scale up uh, to like a little bit like bigger simplicial complexes or as soon as we increase the dimension of the complex, we were ending up not being able to run the simplification on um, on a machine that was like with 64 gigabytes and a couple of cores. So in terms of like the, the test that we run and like the uh, meshes, sorry, the simplicial complex that we used, we were able to terminate on six over uh, 15 of the simplices, but the simplicial complexes that we used. And in this case, like the performances were always much slower than the other two approaches, both our and the skeleton blocker. So in, in that sense, like it was definitely not uh, a scalable approach. Well, thank you very much. Let's thank Federico one more time. And I also want to thank all the speakers of the station. Thank you so much in these uh, difficult conditions in uh, fully virtual uh, conference mode. Thank you very much to everyone. The next event is exactly in one minute. So it's the time to switch the room and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>